A është e pa besushme që krishti u rinjallë prej sëvdekurish? Kam pasur privilegjit a diskutoj këtë pyetje me një nga ekspertët më të mirë në botë të kësa çështje, Dr. Gary Habermas. Dr. Habermas është profesor i dalluar kërkimor i apologjetikës dhe filozofisë në Universitetin Liberty në Amerikë. Ai ka ndjekur studimet universitare në kolegjin William Tandell, përfudoi studimet master në Universitetin e Detroit dhe më pas ka mbrojtur doktoraturën në Universitetin Shtetëror të Miçiganit. Dr. Habermas ja ka përkushtuar jetën e tij profesionale, ekzaminimi të çështjeve domethënëse historike, filozofike e teologjike në lidhje me vdekjen dhe rinjallin e Jezusit. Lista e gjatë e botimeve që mbajnë emrin e tij dhe e debateve në të cilat ka marr pjesë paraqet një pasqyrë të detajuar të gjendjes aktuale të kësaj çështje. Mes debateve të paharrushme radhitan ato me ateistin britanik më pas të kthyer në deist, Anthony Flew. Dr. Habermas ka botuar ose edituar më shumë se 60 tituj librash, si edhe mbi 100 artikuj e kritika në revista shkencore. Vitit e fundit ai është bërë profesor vizitues në rreth 15 shkolla të larta e seminare në shtetet bashkuara të Amerikës e më gjerë. Juftoj tani të ndihni intervistën që kam zhvilluar me ta. Dr. Habermas, thank you for making time to have this conversation together. Thanks. I want to start our conversation with this question. Although throughout your scholarly career, uh, you argue for the evidence of uh, Jesus' resurrection, and yet, as you are well informed, there are people today that not only deny that Jesus did not rise from the dead, but they even deny that he ever lived. How do you respond when you meet such individuals? Well, I think I would just, I would start with maybe an overview and just say that Bart Ehrman, the atheistic New Testament scholar, says as far as he knows, every single one of the thousands of scholars who specialize in one of the fields pertaining to Jesus or archaeology or ancient history or classics, he says he does not know of a single one who teaches in a university, college, or seminary who thinks that Jesus never lived. It's a minority view, he says, largely with the very few exceptions of people who do not have not specialized in the area, and they ignore a lot of, of good evidence. For example, he lists 15 different independent sources for the crucifixion of Jesus within 100 years of Jesus' death. Now, 100 years, I can tell you from studying ancient history, it's not a long time. 100 years is pretty early. Mm. And again, he has 15 independent sources for Jesus' death by crucifixion. So that many sources, uh, we know in the ancient world, many events rest on just one, two, or three sources, as Paul Meyer, uh, ancient historian at Western Michigan, says. So, I, I mean, that's just for starters on the crucifixion. I think we have an excellent case for the historicity of Jesus. So one of the objections that uh, we face in uh, our ministry when we talk to our Muslim friends in, Al in Albania is the opposite, actually, of what you're saying, yep. uh, of the, what the Bible teaches, that Jesus died uh, by right. crucifixion. So the Quran denies the death of of Christ. Could you elaborate a little bit more of those extra biblical evidences that will make the case that uh, that what's the real case for Jesus that he died by crucifixion? I wrote a book years ago called the Historical Jesus and I have a dozen and a half sources for Jesus outside the New Testament none of which are Christian. The most commonly reported event 12 of the 18 sources exactly two-thirds 12 of the 18 sources attest to the death of Jesus. When you use the example that I used a minute ago by Bart Ehrman, 15 uh, independent sources outside the New Testament, you put those two together and you have quite an array of information. Now, I can understand somebody um, reading the Quran and accepting their own book, but the Quran is 600 years later and the the skeptical sources that I'm using uh, are only 100 to 150 years after the death of Jesus. And the probably the most common fact that's reported is the crucifixion. Let us jump to, uh, at the core of your expertise, what are some of the evidences for the resurrection of Jesus? I argue what I call a minimal facts argument. I usually use six facts. Jesus died by crucifixion. 
His disciples thought they saw him again. They had experiences which they believed were appearances of Jesus. They were totally transformed by that belief, even to the point of being willing to die. Now somebody might say, well, how do you know they died? I didn't say they died, although you can show some of the main ones did. Mm -hmm. But my point is they were willing to die for that teaching. Somebody else will say, well, many missionaries and many religions are willing to die. The Buddhist, I still remember the stories of Buddhist priests who set themselves on fire to protest the, the war in Vietnam. So people die for a lot of things willingly. But the thing about the disciples is most of us die for teachings of which we're convinced. The Buddhist priests thought war was wrong mm. and aggression was wrong. They died for that belief. Uh, Christian missionaries today would die for the belief that uh, Jesus was right. Uh, Muslim missionaries would die for the belief that Muhammad was right. Mm -hmm. The difference with the disciples, though, is they would be dying for their central belief, which is the resurrection, mm -hmm. and they know whether Jesus was raised or not mm -hmm. because they saw him. Now, if a Christian today dies for the resurrection, they've not seen the resurrected Jesus. They believe Peter saw the resurrected Jesus. They think mm -hmm. Paul saw the resurrected Jesus. James, the brother of Jesus, saw the resurrected Jesus. But if you're talking about Paul and James and uh, John is the fourth one, and uh, Peter, they know whether they saw him or not. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they were willing to die, and we have first century witnesses for the martyrdoms of Paul, mm. Peter, and James, the brother of Jesus, mm. if somebody put a sword up to their throat and told them to renounce their faith, and they were sure there was an afterlife, they've met Jesus mm. and he, that he was after death, mm. um, it's inexplicable why they would die for what they knew to be false. And again, people say, well, the people die today for it, but they're missing the point. They knew whether he was raised or not. Mm. So that's the third one. The fourth one is the resurrection was proclaimed very, very early. Mm -hmm. Even skeptics allow that the, the teaching of the death and resurrection of Jesus can be traced to immediately after the crucifixion. Now, mm -hmm. This is Bart Ehrman. This is Gert Ludemann, an atheist New Testament, mm -hmm. uh, a New Testament scholar from Germany. Um, Dom Crossan, mm -hmm. a very skeptical New Testament scholar, an Irish New Testament mm -hmm. scholar, they argue that the crucifixion is as strong as anything we can know of in the ancient world. Mm. And yet they're not believers. Mm. I mean, they're not, um, mm. well, I don't know which of them would claim to be Christians or not, but Bart Ehrman is an atheist. Gar Garrett Ludeman's an atheist. So they talk about the crucifixion. I think those are better witnesses mm -hmm. and earlier witnesses. So they, can, they mm -hmm. all believe the mm -hmm. resurrection witness came very early. Mm -hmm. And then fourth and fifth, two skeptics, Paul and James, both come to Jesus when they think they saw the risen Jesus. Now, those five facts, mm. those, sorry, those six, mm. are confirmed by dozens of other evidences. That's why skeptics don't ever question mm. those six as a rule. And uh, so I think that's a great foundation. Mm. And my point is, if all you had were those six, you could argue that the resurrection is the best answer, the best mm. verdict to account for the, the data for those six facts. I believe you include in those six facts the empty tomb, yeah? Michael Cohen and I did the book, The Case for the Resurrection of Jesus. We, we did four facts, only four mm. of them. The number changes because okay. everybody gives you a lot more, but we called it four plus one because the empty tomb is as well accredited as any of these facts. I have a list of 22 skeptical evidences mm -hmm. for the empty tomb. But the reason I don't include it as part of the, the minimal facts mm -hmm. because I also require that all critics, just mm -hmm. about all critics, agree with it. Mm -hmm. And they don't always agree with the empty tomb. It's a pretty high number, mm -hmm. but it's not as high as for the other ones. Mm -hmm. So the empty tomb should be right up there with it, but I don't yeah. count it as one of the minimal facts. Yeah, but we, we imply that the tomb is empty because if we find the tomb to be well, sure. not empty, then our case will not be... There, yes, so. that's correct. And, yeah. and there's, there's, like I said, I'll repeat it again. I don't count it as a minimum fact, but mm -hmm. the evidence is really, really strong for mm -hmm. the empty tomb. Yeah, I'll, I would like to continue a little bit the, the discussion there at the empty tomb. So uh, 
the skeptics, when you will mention that as an argument, the empty tomb, they, I guess they will, they will bring up alternative explanations of yep. why the empty tomb. Could you mention right. some of them? And then, and why do you think they fail? Probably the most common one is they'll say that it was common to throw criminals into a common grave. And even if you forget the, the common grave one, a little variation of that is the way most Jews buried was in a rectangular hole in the ground, just like we bury today, but without a casket. They'll put the body in the ground. And, uh, but, but there's some problems. There's no evidence that that was done for Jesus. Mm -hmm. No evidence whatsoever that Jesus was thrown in a pit. Mm -hmm. No evidence that Jesus was buried in a rectangular grave. Mm -hmm. A lot of evidence for the fact that he was buried in a, a rich man's tomb. All four Gospels report it, and mm -hmm. critics might say, well, they just copied from one another, but they didn't. These mm. sources are from around the Mediterranean. And Matthew and Luke made mm. use of market points, but John's a totally separate witness. Mm. And we do know that Matthew and Luke used other traditions. Mm. Uh, Mark, for example, used what's called the pre-Mark and Passion narrative that reports the empty tomb and the burial, the proper burial. So mm. we have a lot of evidence for the proper burial we can suppose what else there is, but there's not one speck of evidence that he was buried in a common grave mm -hmm. or in a normal plot of, in, the, in the dirt. Now, in your writings and in your talks, you also mentioned uh, that one of the strongest uh, evidences that the, uh, the tomb was empty and uh, the resurrection is true is the fact that the, the first who testify about this are women. So yep. why this is important? In this it's discussion? very important because in the, not just in the Jewish world, but in the ancient Mediterranean world, female testimony was played down. It's not true that they couldn't testify in a court of law. They could, but it was played down. And four writers in four different parts of the Mediterranean world would, would not all account for the story by using women if that was not going to get them any respect. Mm -hmm. In fact, Luke and John tell us that men ran back to the tomb to confirm what the women said. If that's it, and you're going to get much more respect for the men, mm -hmm. why not start your story of the empty tomb with the two men going to the tomb? Mm -hmm. Why start with the women? The only, I think, only serious reason is because they did it because that's what happened. They're telling the truth. So in, in critical language. The women were embarrassing witnesses because if that's all you got, it's not all you have, but if that's all you're going to show us, you're not putting your strongest foot forward. Mm. But the, the truth is, they were telling it like it was reported and like the evidence says. Another objection come that uh, these uh, evidences primarily come from uh, New Testament writings. Yep. So these Writings are written by Jesus' friends, right. okay? So right. one would expect to find there a glorified view of the master that they followed. So does this make the case that these are not reliable? Yeah, you know, the interesting thing is these skeptical New Testament scholars that I'm talking about, Bart Ehrman, Bart uh, uh, Ludeman, and the others, Dom Crossan, they're going to say that's a silly comeback hmm. because cr skeptics today... People who don't know what they're talking about will sometimes say, we won't use any biblical source. But that's not the way the skeptical New Testament scholars do it. They will let you use sources that are accredited sources. In other words, here's another way to say it. You could only use texts that have reasons to believe they're true. That's the only ones. And skeptics, just to give you one example, of the 13 books that bear Paul's name, they will give you seven of them, and you can use seven of Paul's books. Mm -hmm. Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Philippians, 1st Thessalonians, Philemon. You can use all seven books. They don't think they're inspired or anything, but they think they're good texts written by Paul. Bart Ehrman, the atheist New Testament scholar, calls them indisputable, and almost every New Testament skeptic says that. So these are guys who many times are not Christians, Many times, maybe Jewish New Testament scholars, and they're going to say, use them. That's good material. Now, mm -hmm. a skeptic who's not trained, who hasn't gone to school, can come along and say, oh, no, no, you can't use that. That's a prejudiced witness. Mm -hmm. 
they could say what they want to, but the mm. scholars don't say that, and even unbelieving scholars don't say that. Mm. So it's it just don't you can't use the New Testament mm. indiscriminately with these critics, but you can use the texts from the New Testament that are well attested. You have researched uh, in another topic, in another area, which is near-death experiences. Right. And, uh, and you know about claims of people that uh, they've claimed they have died, right. perhaps a couple minutes or an hour, oh, I don't know, yep, and they've come sure. back to life. Right. Now, why Jesus' resurrection is different from those ex uh, cases? Good question. I debated a man a few years ago who held that view, and we debated this in a journal. There are a lot of reasons the resurrection of Jesus does not fit. It's nothing like those cases. Uh, for one thing, here's a couple examples. Jesus wasn't dead for, you said, minutes or maybe a half hour or an hour. By the time they got Jesus down from the cross, um, buried his body properly, took it to the place, put it in there, they had to get this done very quickly before sundown on the first day. And that's not 30 seconds out, 45 seconds out, or even five minutes out. It doesn't fit the scenario. Secondly, uh, he, as we've just been talking about, he's got an empty tomb. If somebody has a near-death experience, and if they were prematurely buried, which, is, by the way, has happened a few times, and if they were prematurely buried, if you dug them up, the body's not going to be gone. The body's still going to be there. But Jesus' body, the empty tomb, in other words, is a big problem for this view. Here's another one. Jesus predicted his resurrection ahead of time. Now, people might say, so what? Well, skeptics increasingly believe Jesus probably did predict his death and, and resurrection or glorification ahead of time. If he predicted it, that means it wasn't a happenstance, anything goes, it was a planned event. How do you know? Because somebody knows about it. If someone said to you, we're going to a birthday party this Saturday, you can't get to the birthday party and say, hey, what'd you all do? Wake up this morning and decide to have a birthday party? No, because I told you three days ago we're going to the birthday party. Well, if Jesus said there was gonna, I'm going to die and I'm going to rise, it tells you it's a planned event. That does not fit the scenario. Uh, plus, there are group appearances with Jesus. Uh, we know of several group appearances for Jesus. Even the most skeptical scholars like the Jesus Seminar admit evidence for group appearances. You don't have, if, you, if you're lucky enough to have uh, an NDE, a, 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 a near-death experience, where more than one person has witnessed it, that's going to be pretty rare. But you don't see it happen over and over and over again. And by the way, when the person comes back, they're alive. So they're not a candidate for that kind of thing anyway. So anyway, these are a lot of differences. But Jesus', Jesus is, um, uh, case just doesn't fit it. Here's another one. When he throws, shows himself to them, his scars are already healed. Mm. How can scars, if a person has a near-death experience, when they come back and they've had their chest, I mean, I, have a, I know of a case where the person's chest was split open and they were working on him. When they come to, they don't stand there and say, look at my scar, I'm all healed, it's all sewed up. No, you don't heal like that. But Jesus was already healed. There's just a, a number of, of items that are not anywhere near the same between NDEs and the resurrection appearances. Let us conclude with one final question. Okay. Uh, if one would come to the conviction that, yes, Jesus really, truly rose from the dead, yep. what does the resurrection prove? And what one uh, should do about it? Well, you know, I'm just talking over dinner tonight with a person, and I was saying, let's think about this. Jesus predicted the resurrection. If he's a mere man and he dies, he can't raise himself. The old saying, dead men don't do things, dead men don't do anything. If he's lying there in a slab and he's dead, how's he going to be raised again? We're assuming the resurrection. If there is a resurrection, you said, how would it be practical? What would it mean? If he's going to be raised, no man can come along and raise him. Nobody can come take him by the hand and lead, lead him away. Jesus isn't going to raise himself. He's dead. So Jesus' claim is that his father, God, would raise him from the dead. Now, one other problem. If God raised him from the dead, was it because he loved him or hated him? It Was it because he approved of him or he disapproved of him? 
If Jesus is a heretic or a false prophet, mm -hmm. why is God raising him? Now, we have a lot of reasons to believe Jesus claimed to be deity. A lot of reasons. He forgave sin, and the Jewish leaders thought that was blasphemy. But there's other reasons. And if he claimed to be God, why would God have raised him from the dead if it were a lie? And Jesus said also, what would be blasphemy if it weren't true? He said, what you do with me determines where you spend eternity. Not just I have the words of life, I am the words of life. You're looking at me. You're looking mm -hmm. at the plan of salvation. You're looking at heaven. Nobody else said that. Why would God raise him from the dead if he claimed to be the son of God and it'd be the only way to heaven if he were a heretic? So right away you say, what difference does it make? It makes a difference if God raised him because there's a God and he approved of Jesus. It means Jesus is his son. It means that his way is the only way. And there's some real practical things. In 1995, my, my wife died of stomach cancer. And when, when you lose somebody who's so close to you, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, we grieve, but not as those without hope. There's a lot of difference between being sorrowful when someone dies, like Jesus and Lazarus, and, and grieving knowing you'll see them again. And the Christian hope is that we'll see them again. So resurrection and our most intimate daily affairs, will you see your mother again? Will you see your father again? Will you see your wife? Will you see your child? The resurrection says we will be with them. The, in the New Testament, the doctrine that is tied to resurrection of Jesus more than any other doctrine is that we will be raised like him. That should make the ultimate difference in, the, in life and give us ultimate peace. So if I would summarize it, it seems that you are saying that the hope that Christianity has falls or stands exactly. in resurrection. And Paul said that, of course. If we, if we live, he said, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. But either way, we, we are the Lord's. Yes, mm -hmm. his son's death and resurrection secured eternal life mm -hmm. for us. And I can't think of a better message, just the best message in the world. Now, in light of what you said, uh, for our viewers, uh, what will be your final message, especially for those who haven't considered anything about Jesus? If Jesus hasn't been raised from the dead, nothing else matters. But let's just say it this way. If Jesus has been raised from the dead, everything matters. Everything's before us. It, it was the greatest message in the world in the early church, and it's the greatest message today. Christians have something and someone to live for. Well, Dr. Habermas, it has been a pleasure to dialogue Thank with you. you today. Thank you. Enjoyed it.